there's a lot of variation when we deal with genetics. Penetrance is one where if if you get the genes, as you inherit them from your parents, how likely are they to be expressed? So genotype of the genes, phenotype is the expression. Uh, and, and some genes are not very penetrant. You can have them and maybe never know you have them. Or maybe they turn on late in life when you're 70 or 80 years old. Suddenly you start having physical problems that you never had before. And you didn't realize you had maybe a lethal gene that was not very penetrant. And here's an example, uh, cystic fibrosis, highly penetrant. 100% of the people who have the um, homozygous condition, so that means both chromosomes, all right, chromosomes occur in pairs. So if you have the uh, transmembrane conductive regulator gene, we just call it CFTR for short. If you have that on both chromosomes, then you are going to get cystic fibrosis and you probably get hit early in life. And what that is, is that chloride ions are not being uh, properly transported across membranes. And the result is uh, mucus. Mucus is a good thing in our bodies, right? It carries a lot of defense cells, but too much mucus, you can see the upper right, it's going to occlude airways, uh, and not just airways, but also organs, you know, sinuses, uh, throughout the body. It's a system-wide issue which is being treated fairly effectively but um, it's still a, it's a lifelong uh, challenge. Aneuploidy, there's different types of aneuploidy. Uh, what it is is there's been a, a mistake, we'll call it a mistake, during meiosis. All right? Meiosis is when the uh, sperm and egg form and we'll take a look at that in a minute. Uh, and instead of having a pair, which we all have chromosome pairs, 23 pairs, 46 total, uh, there's the XX, this is a female, right? There's the six chromosomes. Uh, here's a trisomy, three. Now it's called a non disjunction, and sometimes you have three, sometimes you have one. Uh, let's look at and, and see how that happens. Uh, um, because we have the parents here with paired chromosomes and then we have uh, two stages of meiosis and when that happens this is what we expect haploid half the number of genes uh, are present and and then we end up with one and one but in a non disjunction you're going to have some that only have one chromosome and some that might have three and it's not always the 21st I mentioned 21st because that's Down syndrome. But there's Kleinfelters, there's Turner syndrome. Uh, there's many different types of trisomy. Uh, often they're lethal, and so they're never, you know, they're, ne they're not born alive. Uh, they're, they're, uh, there's a miscarriage. Okay, so I like this little video because it's going to show us these stages of meiosis. It's a nice review. All right, that's a diploid condition. Interphase, it's resting. And then, uh, and, oh, they're just going to show us one chromosome in this case, which is the 21st. They're going to duplicate during interphase. Then, prophase, they're preparing to divide. Spindle fibers are going to pull them. There's metaphase. And we're moving on to anaphase. And there's that cytokinesis, okay? This is moving fast. Now in meiosis, we have a, a second division. That's how we get haploid cells. That's how we make sperm and egg. All right, so now we have haploid, half of the parents. And so this one can join to the egg or sperm or the other. And we end up with a diploid, two in. In non-disjunction, it's worth watching this because, you know, once you see it, uh, it, it all starts to make sense. All right, so interphase, preparing to divide. Uh, chromosomes are duplicated. 
Then prophase, they're going to shorten, thicken. We're getting down to metaphase pretty soon. The spindle fiber is going to attach. Yeah, there's a spindle fiber to the centriole. It's going to pull apart. Everything's looking good. Anaphase. We have telophase, cytokinesis. All right, now here's where the problem occurs. Okay, spindle fiber is going to pull. Now look right up the top. The chromosomes did not pull apart. The centrioles held them together. And now this egg or sperm has an extra chromosome. And that's how we care. All right, pretty slick. I like that. It, it really covers that. Uh, how do we detect aneuploidy? Well, one way is uh, photoscopy. Photoscopy is also called endoscopy. It's a type of endoscopic uh, procedure where uh, visual access, all right, so a um, camera is inserted and there's different ways that it's inserted. I like this. This is actual photoscopy here. This is a, there's different types of photoscopy, but at some point you will see her opening her mouth because they do fetal breathing. Okay, they're not really breathing um, oxygen. I mean, they're getting the oxygen from the umbilical cord, but there is the breath. Okay. Amniocentesis. Here, I better stop that because we're all going to be watching it. All right. Um, amniocentesis is a, a method that is used in conjunction with ultrasound. And we do the ultrasound so that the uh, fetus is not um, punctured. All right. Because I mean, that, that would be tragic. And it's happened. All right. So in the case of amniocentesis, a long sterile needle is inserted through the, the, the body wall, okay, and it goes into the amniotic cavity. And what's going to happen here is the cells in the amniotic cavity are going to be uh, extracted through a hypodermic needle. And this this uh, this is a physician here, not a tech, okay. There, Technicians can work with these images, but to actually draw the fluid, that requires uh, advanced training. So, so the goal is to not puncture the fetus. Because this is a screening technique. Um, I'm going to keep talking here. Fetal cells are uncultured. And, and then we're going to photograph them. Okay, I kind of want to see the... Uh, yeah, he's having a hard time. It's not so easy. <laughs> Ultrasounds are uh, they're fairly inexpensive and invasive, but non-invasive, but uh, they're tricky. Okay, I want to skip ahead. We want to see the big needle because the needle is interesting. He's going to take the needle, and when he finds the right location, he's got the uh, ultrasound going there. Let's see if we can see the needle. Got the needle. He's working the needle right now, uh, and he's watching the screen. Don't watch us, guy. <laughs> watch the screen, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, continuing with amniocentesis, I mentioned karyotyping. We're going to take pictures, photographs of the chromosomes, maybe fluoresce them a little bit. Like this is these are fluoresced, and range them from largest to smallest in a karyotype. There's the word here, and uh, looking good, right? Oh, there's a trisomy, number eight. Okay, so that could be severe. Yeah, okay, 21st doesn't show up here. Okay, uh, coronic villus sampling is cons uh, considered safer because instead of going through the body cavity, we are going through the um, vagina with a, I'll use a, a speculum and a catheter to collect the fluids. So we're just going uh, through the cervix to reach the placenta. All right, I, I'm cautious about either technique because this is a sterile environment, and when we start r running needles through body cavities, we are put possibly pushing uh, surface bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus, into this environment and contaminating it. And so this is done when there's a you know a history of 
uh, you know, um, family history or the mother's over 41 or so. There's different uh, different protocols. Okay, point mutation. This is a small one because DNA has base pairs, T to A, C to G, and sometimes there's just one base pair out of millions. And we can do something simple like an alpha fetal uh, protein test, FP, and we can detect some uh, such as spina bifida, and that's where the neural uh, tube, it's a mutation, the neural tube is not developed properly. And it can be, the cool thing about this is it can be done early in the pregnancy, right? And then the parents can decide, you know, maybe if they're young and, I mean, I'm not going to say what people should do, but um, it's nice having options early rather than late in the pregnancy when the fetus is already developed and then it becomes a more emotional. Gene inactivation. I, I talked a little bit about this as we age. Some genes turn off, some turn on. Uh, lactose intolerance, or sometimes called lactose malabsorption. That's going to happen as we age for many of us. See, lactose is broken apart by an enzyme, lactase, into two types of sugars. But if this stage doesn't happen, then milk sugar is going to build up. Uh, it's really not that serious. You know, maybe some gas, diarrhea, bloating after consuming dairy. It, um, it can be serious in infants when they can't um, have uh, galactosidase issues. Uh, and, and that's usually screened in the hospital. And that's a severe, severe form of lactose intolerance. So um, there's different uh, levels. Okay, continue with the inactivation. Cigarette smoke. People don't realize it, but there's this thing called epigenetics where, now here's the word, that um, cigarette smoke is a mutagen, okay, it causes cancer, we know that, but it has a certain signature that rep, uh, resembles um, COPD. And so let's say you're exposed to cigarette smoke, you know, maybe not just one time, but uh, several times, it can alter your DNA so that you develop um, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease like um, it could be something simple like asthma or complicated like emphysema and vaping does this too so it's weird people that smoke I've just dissected lots of human bodies and man, I've seen the lung tissue but what I can't see when I'm dissecting a human is the DNA uh, of that victim and what's going on there. So it's kind of interesting how epigenetics can be affected by our environment. And that includes emotional trauma, like the Holocaust uh, victims in the Nazi concentration camps. They seem to have uh, altered DNA because of their experience, and they produce low levels. Uh, probably should have highlighted low, low baseline levels of uh, cortisol, which uh, if you look at your kidneys, First of all, the kidneys are these adrenal glands, and that's where you produce your stress hormones, which are not always bad, right? We uh, <laughs> Stress is not a bad thing like people think. We're built for that to some extent. But um, in these Holocaust victims, they produce low levels, and it may, maybe that has to do with living in constant stress, you know, day and night. Eventually, um, the DNA changes, and they became adapted to stress. No one knows. Even parenting, okay, research on parenting. Uh, the, as we parent our children, that may have an epigenetic effect on their genes. Okay, we don't know enough about this, but there's enough evidence that's telling us that, you know, children are precious. They need to be loved and protected. And thank goodness we have laws that, um, and we have uh, agencies that make sure children are safe. All right, so you can see that genetics is really a, a wild and mysterious process with lots of variation. Thanks for listening.